car. You don't have to get out. Afterwards, after the services, if you have offering, you want to come up here and bring it up here and just lay it down or give it to one of us, we'll come to your vehicle and pick it up, whatever you want to do. As I said, I'm already filled up. My cup is overflowing right now. I think just being different, just knowing that God's in control has got me excited. During this unprecedented time, because of this virus, because of all the anxiety, because of the lack of hope it seems that this country is displaying right now, I've done a lot of praying, a lot of thinking about what I needed to say for meditation to help get our hearts right and prepared for communion. I was sitting in my office and it was storming at the time. It was thundering really loud. Boom, 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 boom. Just kept on the thunder. And this song, How Great Thou Art, just hit home to me. But I went to the back door and I opened up my... The back door and I opened it up because, I, I mean, I'm kind of crazy. I like to watch the storms. And as it was thundering real bad, I opened up the back door and all I could see and hear was the birds frolicking around. That's all they were doing. They were still singing. They were still frolicking around. I thought, wow. Even in the storm, they're praising God. And I was impressed with that. And of course, my thoughts came back to the storm that we're living in right now. Who would have ever thought we're sitting in a parking lot having church? And we can praise Him for that as well. But... I don't think that we're exhibiting the trust that those birds did. They're in the storm. They're still singing and praising God. And we are here today. But I'm just talking about as a whole, as the nation as a whole, as Christians as a whole, we are not exhibiting the trust. Uh-oh. Did you still hear me? That these birds were. And I'm going to read a lot of passages to you because God's Word speaks a lot better than I can. And those, these are the passages that came to my mind and hopefully it will prepare our hearts for communion. Matthew 6, 25-27 says this, That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your Heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to Him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. John 16, 33, I've told you these things so that in you, in me, you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Philippians 4, 6-7, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Jeremiah 17, 17, I mean 7 and 8, but blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank with roots that reach deep in the water, such trees are not bothered by the heat or worried by long months of drought. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Psalms 112, 7 and 8. They do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. They are confident and fearless and can face their foes triumphantly. Church, where is our faith? Christ has overcome the world. Christ has overcome coronavirus. Yes. He has defeated death. Yes, yes. Again, 16, John 16, 33 says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth you will have trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. So how did he overcome the world? The world was defeated or overcome when Jesus accepted his Father's will to go to the cross. He broke and defeated the power of sin and death through His own sacrificial death. He brought life and immortality to light. He ensured that death would not have the final say. So in the middle of sorrows and trials, in the middle of the coronavirus mess, 
we can take heart and have peace. Not because things are easy, but because the hard things of this life are temporary and are pre preparing us for eternal glory. Amen. Our peace is not in the absence of troubles, but in Jesus and what He's done to make our future sure. Praise Let's remember His victory as we celebrate in communion with Him. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise You this time right now. We praise You for Your mighty power. We praise You for overcoming this world. And as we take of this bread that represents Your body, and just re help us to remember that ultimate sacrifice that You went to Calvary's cross to overcome the world. You went to Calvary's cross so that we can live that we don't have to have fear, that we can have peace, and we praise you for it. And help us take this in a manner that pleases and lifts you up. In Jesus' name I pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross, Father. It was a uh, sacrifice that for all times, Father, we gave our sins. We're just so thankful. And as we partake of this uh, bread and this cup this morning, we just bring honor and glory to that sacrifice. And Father, we just say thank you. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
Well, what a morning, huh? Couldn't ask for a better day to be outside. And uh, as we're constantly reminded of, God is good. Amen? Is this on? Oh, I know y'all could be louder than that. Yeah. I know y'all could be like, no honking, please. <laughs> I'm just teasing. Do what you want. If the Lord calls you to shout, shout. If he causes you to honk, honk. But God is good. I wanted to uh, remind us uh, of what we talked about last week. How God does everything on purpose. Everything that Jesus did on his road to the cross was on purpose. And I think what Jesus' life is one of the biggest things that, that should speak to us, especially in times like this. We too need to do everything on purpose. From the moment we get up to the time we get on social media, with which I'll be honest with you, this uh, quarantine and social distancing and everything else, I think most of us are on it a little too much. Guilty as charged. I think that we need to make sure that everything we do, from the things we post to the things we say to the air we breathe, everything needs to be done on purpose. You might recall as we've gone through the Gospel of John, that Jesus performed seven signs that John pointed out. Uh, John points out he's doing this on purpose to draw our attention to creation because creation is broken. This virus that we're facing is not a result of whatever we want to say it's a result of. It's a result of broken creation. The broken things that people do to each other is the result of a broken creation. And so just as in seven days, God created all things. In seven signs, Jesus reversed the effects of broken creation. Here's what I mean. In John 2.11, the first sign that John points to us is at the wedding at Cana when Jesus turns the water into the wine. The second sign is when Jesus healed an official son without even being present. You might recall in John 4, 47, when the man comes and begs, and Jesus says, go on your way, your son is healed. And when the man met his servants coming at him, he asked him what time of day his son was healed, and it was at the very time that Jesus said it happened. The third sign, the lame man by the pool of Bethesda, in John 5, 1 to 15, you might recall the man was sitting down and, and in some verses it says, or versions it says an angel used to stool, stir the pool of the water and he was waiting for 30 years for someone to put him in the pool. And Jesus simply asked him, do you want to be healed? And with a word, just as in creation, Jesus healed that man. Then there was the feeding of the 5,000 with seven loaves and two fish. With the word, Jesus prayed over it. And seven loaves and two fish fed 5,000 men and their families. John chapter 6, verses 1 to 15. And you might recall John chapter 9, verse 1 to 34, when Jesus healed the man born blind. And with the word, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. When he said, Lazarus, come forth. John chapter 11, verses 1 to 44. The last of the seventh sign is the most important of the seven signs. And that is the cross. Because at the cross, what humanity did in their disobedience was reversed once and for all. Jesus put to death through His obedience what Adam brought about in his disobedience. When Jesus said the words, it is finished, he meant that the work of God in him was complete. See, on our own, the author of Hebrews reminds us, we are incapable of helping ourselves. The author of Hebrews reminds us that every single day in the temple they need to make a sacrifice. What Jesus did on the cross once and for all wiped our debts clean. And so today what we're going to talk about is Jesus actually being on trial to accomplish that seventh sign. Now, I'm not going to ask you all to stand up for the reading of God's Word. 
But as a way of honoring the reading of God's Word, would you please raise your hand with me as we uh, get through it? When Jesus had spoken these words, He went out with His disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden which He and His disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed Him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with His disciples. I love it. Jesus' disciples knew His habit so much, they knew where to find Him. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have not lost one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? And all God's people said, Oh, you can get louder than that. All God's people said, All right. Now, church, I think this is important. Perhaps one of the most important moments in Jesus' ministry though thus far. Proof that Jesus did everything on purpose. You might recall that in Galilee, they sought to stone Him. But did they catch Him? No. You might recall that at one point, they tried to arrest Him and get Him tried. But could they catch Him in Jerusalem? No. So when you're looking at this moment here, and Jesus spoke the words, I am, when they came to look for Him, they drew back and fell down on their faces. Could Jesus have gotten away should he have wanted to? Absolutely. This goes to show that Jesus, no one took his life, but he willingly gave it. Jesus knew all that would happen. He knew that there would be a kangaroo court where he would be bounced from person to person, from the high priest and his father-in-law to the uh, court at Pilate's palace to Herod's palace and back again. He knew that he was going to be humiliated. He knew that they were going to pull his beard out and, and strike him on the face. He knew that he would be chastised with a cat of nine tails until he was beaten so badly you couldn't recognize him. Jesus did everything on purpose when we put Jesus on trial church know that he does everything on purpose this moment right now that we're experiencing this disease that's rampaging through our country this is not a surprise to God nor is your position during this point Jesus is still on trial today, I'm going to tell you. How? Because people are watching His followers. People are wondering what His followers will do. To either say, see, I told you it was false, or to say, wow, I don't know what's wrong with those Christians, but I want some of it. In certain states, I don't know what they're smoking, but can you give me some? Stupid joke, but there it is, I don't care. Church, Something we need to consider always is that you are the only Bible some people see. Your Facebook posts or your social media posts are the only scriptures somebody may get to know. And God has placed you in this time and this place to give hope when there is little. I've been listening to certain points of the media and I'm going to tell you I've had to turn it off. Anybody with me on that? Because I'm tired of hearing peddling a false hope. You know what? Hope is not ever false. When we preach about hope, we preach about something beyond what this world can offer. And I'm going to tell you, there are many beautiful things in this world. This day and the birds singing all around us is one of those examples. 
But in this world, we also have trouble. In this world, we have pestilence. We have war. We have famine. We have strife. We have earthquakes. As much as there is beautiful in this world, as I said before, this world is also broken. So our hope is never false. Should this tent crumple up and wither away, I know it's merely just a house for what's going on to be with the Lord. I find solace and, and truth and comfort in the words of Scripture so we will be with Him always. When we get to that celestial city, we're going to be in the presence of Christ forever. But you know what? The thing is, Jesus didn't die just for some future hope. He died so that you and I could be ambassadors of the kingdom right now so that in our little slice of this broken world, we could bring His perfection. And so church, right now, as the world is watching you, how are you responding? How are you being like Jesus and facing the accusers? We've got the I am living inside us through his Holy Spirit. Shouldn't we stand proudly and firmly in the middle of this storm and say, my God is bigger than this? No matter what this circumstance brings us, shouldn't we be the place that people look to for hope? Because we don't peddle any false hope. We have a hope in Jesus Christ, and that is eternal. This world and everything in it is going to pass away. But our hope is in the eternal God. As Jesus boldly faced His adversaries, let us know that as Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6, our enemies are not flesh and blood, but principalities and powers and spiritual forces over this present darkness in the heavenly places. Our enemies are not this disease. Our enemies are spiritual and something is trying to suck the life out of the church. Well, I'm encouraged this morning to see that you cannot stop God's people. Jesus promised a few days later, I don't know how many, it doesn't tell us in John, but he looked at Peter, he said, therefore I call you Peter, and on this rock I shall build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Church, where does your hope lie? Jesus, knowing what would happen to him, faced the storm. Jesus, knowing the humiliations and the beatings and the betrayal he would face, Face the storm. Jesus, knowing that the cross was inevitable, faced the storm. And church, some of us have said this before. I've repeated it. Well, that was Jesus. He could do anything. Well, guess what? In, in the book of Acts, Stephen was able to stand before all these wise and learned men and tell them about their own faith that they didn't understand. And when he was faced with his own cross to bear, his stoning, he looked up into heaven and God showed him that at the right hand of the Father was Christ Jesus. And alongside Jesus, he was able to whisper the words, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they're doing. The Apostle Paul in the book of Philippians was able to say in his confinement, hear that word, church. He was able to say when he was chained to a guard day and night, members of Caesar's household greet you. Why? Because you might have chained up the Apostle Paul, but you could not chain up the message of the gospel. And so people watched the Apostle Paul and they couldn't help themselves but give themselves to this Christ whom this crazy guy followed. And that same power we are assured by Scripture that rose Jesus from the grave also dwells in us, church. Do you believe it this morning? So church, let us like Jesus stand up to our accusers and look them in the eye and show them who lives in us. Verse 12 tells us, so the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus. Forgive me, I'm not used to standing still while I preach. And they bound him. You notice how arrogant they were? He fell on or they fell on their faces, but they acted like they did something big. They bound him up to show the priests what they did. First, they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, 
who was the high priest that year. Even though Caiaphas was the high priest, look who held the, held the power. It was Caiaphas who advised the Jews it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You are also not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. You notice there's a little contrast there between Jesus' words and Peter's. Peter's words did not echo what Christ Jesus said. Jesus said, I am he. Peter said, I am not. Why is this important, church? Because like I said, the world is watching us. And at this point, I'm not going to blame Peter because Peter lacked what you and I have. Peter did not have the power of the Holy Spirit with inside him yet. Jesus, as you recall from the last few sermons, had been promising this helper would come, but first Jesus had to go away. But I'm going to tell you, church, right now some of our actions, and I'm saying this to me here, some of our actions are showing the world, they are asking us, and we are saying, I am not. We're denying Jesus at his most pivotal moment when Peter boasted and bragged. And he said, Lord, I'll go with you even to death. In this moment, he said, I am not. I don't know about y'all, but I've said I am not too many times in my life. I may not have said it in so many words, but my actions and the things I've said and done outside of the church building have proved otherwise. It's time for us today, church, it's time for us today to stop being like Peter. Think about this. Before this disease hit, how many of us were posting, my God is in control confidently? I had a friend say this on Facebook last night. So if he's watching, this, I mean, this, this was just, I think, from God. How many of us were posting confidently, Christ is in control before all this happened? And where have those posts gone on Facebook? How many of us instead are pointing out the dangers to our own skin, our own flesh and blood, when Jesus walked in boldly to be arrested, to be tried? His disciples who bragged scattered. And Peter said, I am not. I'm not saying this to shame anyone but myself. It's time for us, church, to stand boldly, stand alongside Jesus Christ, and face what's coming. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off. Think about this. Jesus actually had put the guy's ear back on according to the gospel of Luke. So I don't know about y'all, but I think you'd recognize that one of the guys who was with the guy who put your cousin's ear back on after it was sliced off. He asked, did I not see you in the garden with him. Well, actually, I skipped way ahead. I apologize, y'all. He said, I am not. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. You see, the disciples who said they'd stand with him, he was asking, where are they? Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard what I've said. They know what I said. When he had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Ananias, or excuse me, Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. I want you all to think about this for a minute. Jesus did everything out in the open. And what he said was actually a slight and a shame to the high priest and to the council. Think about everything they did. Jesus openly proclaimed. And every time he openly proclaimed, they got angry. And what did they do? They met in secret. 
If we have to meet in secret to do things, and I'm not saying sometimes there's going to be church where we're going to have to meet in secret. It's going to happen. Persecutions and trials will come. But if we're not openly proclaiming the word of God with our actions in our lives and we're keeping our relationship personal, are we really sharing the gospel as we're mandated? See, what happens is a lot of us will say, because we've been raised on this in the last 30, 40 years, we don't talk about religion and politics because it's rude. But I'm going to ask you a question. What's more rude, to care for a temporary security or someone's eternity? When we say those things, when we don't share the gospel, when we're not open about our Christian faith, what we are doing, when we are not open about our trust and our faith in God, what we are doing is just like Peter. We're saying, I am not one of this man's followers. When Jesus stood on trial, he stood alone. Even though John, who's that other disciple, he didn't like to mention his name, and Peter were standing just a little ways off, they were still denying him. When the high priest, and let's face it, John calls him the high priest, question about his disciples, which one of his disciples came forward and stood up with him? Church, just like Jesus did, let us not say anything in secret. Let us do everything on purpose. And let's make sure that we are making Jesus' name great. I would rather someone hate me temporarily and be me or be with me eternally than for them to like me now and spend an eternity in hell away from our Father in heaven. When Jesus says, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where rust and moth cannot destroy and the thief cannot break in and steal, what are those treasures? Our treasure first and foremost is Jesus Christ himself. But if I'm going, I want as many as possible to go with me. When we're keeping people safe but we're not giving them eternity, we're sending people to hell with healthy bodies and full stomachs. I know that sounds harsh, church, but we need to hear that today. Because really, honestly, I'm going to tell you, I'm not preaching to you, I'm preaching to me. I have been guilty in my life of trying to be a popular preacher. I've been guilty of trying to preach what people want to hear. But the real fact of the matter is, I've only got one whom I have to please, and he already sent his son to die for me. What's that say about him? So church, are we, Peter, saying, I am not? Or are we standing alongside Christ saying, I am with him? Verse 25, the verse that I skipped ahead to because the, the wind's distracting my page turning. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you are also not one of this, his disciples, are you? He denied and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it. And at once the rooster crowed. Something that sticks out to me is in one of the gospel lessons, I believe it's in Luke, it said Jesus at that moment locked eyes with Peter. Could you imagine boasting and bragging in Christ and when the moment counted, I am not. Saying, I will go with you to death. I will do anything. And Peter boasted a pretty big game, didn't he? I am not. Well, church, I'm going to repeat this, and I think it bears repeating. If we, by our actions and our words, do not show our faith in God at all times, when it counts the most to people who are watching, we are saying, I am not with him. I know that sounds harsh, and I know that sounds cruel, but I've got to preach the truth to you. Why? Because God preaches the truth to me. If I'm not proclaiming the word of God, and I'm going to tell you what, since this whole thing started, I've had people who are personally attacking me. And I'm not saying this to boast, because the only boasting I have is in Christ Jesus. But what I'm saying is, people are thinking what I'm saying is dangerous. Guess what? The gospel is dangerous. The gospel is dangerous to people who are dying. The gospel is dangerous to people in the dark, because if you hear the gospel message and you don't respond to it, you are dooming not anyone else but yourself. The gospel is dangerous to those who live in the dark, because when light is shed on darkness, all our sin becomes uncovered. The gospel is dangerous because it demands newness. And the passing of the way 
of the old. Verse 28 tells us, Then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. Listen to how contradictory that is. In order to take the Passover, according to the Levitical law, you had to follow the purity things. They were consorting with Gentiles and doing impure things and having all these secret meetings, but they wanted to make sure they were clean. Does that sound like anything we've heard recently? We want to make sure our bases are covered, but you know what? Let's throw this man to the wolves. And what they were doing, even then, they brought Jesus to a Gentile court instead of handling the business themselves. Why? Because they were cowards. They considered tax collectors who worked for the Roman Empire to be less than dirt, and yet they themselves were willing to betray their countrymen to him. All because his message was dangerous. And yet they did it anyway. But Jesus did everything on purpose. He knew what was going to happen. So listen to this. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered him, If this man were not doing evil, would we not have delivered him to you? That sounds like my kids when they get caught doing something wrong. Think about it. Like, I, And I'm just going to throw you boys under the bus. I'm sorry because you're the best example i got. But when my boys are doing something wrong and they get caught, the first thing they do is try and turn it back either on me or on each other. They didn't actually bring any accusations against Jesus, did they? If he weren't doing evil, would we have bothered? The very first thing we did when we got caught by God in the garden was blame one another, didn't we? And so Jesus is working on purpose to reverse the evil of our hearts. In this. Listen to this. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. And the Jews said to him, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. Just a few days earlier, they were willing to pick up stones to throw at him. And now they were too afraid. My guess is because if this was to backfire, you know what they were going to do? They were going to say, Well, it was the Romans' fault. If the people were afraid of them, over and over, the Pharisees were afraid of what other people thought. How often are we afraid of what other people think? And so we do and say things that are not proper for us to do as Christians. But to justify our own means. We do them anyway. Again, church, I'm not preaching to anyone out here. I'm preaching to me. How are our actions on purpose? The Pharisees were not really prepared to go to Pilate. They weren't prepared to judge Jesus by their own law. They were ready to throw him to the wolves. How prepared do we stand? When Jesus stood before Pilate, listen to this. Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into this world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said this question the world is asking us now. What is truth? Church, the world is asking the same question as Pilate. What is truth? Jesus put it in terms that he could understand. You see, as a Roman, Pilate worshiped Caesar as God. And Jesus himself was declaring in language that uh, Pilate can understand, I have come into this world. My kingdom is not of this world. I too, <laughs> even beyond your false gods, I am a God. And I've come to declare the truth. 
And so we know from the other gospel accounts that Pilate actually was terrified to do anything against Jesus, wasn't he? Why? Because here was this man who he knew spoke in truth and power. He knew this man was a God, even to the degree when he was crucified and he said, it is finished, and he let his life come out of his breath. One of Pilate's own centurions stated, surely this man is the Son of God. Outsiders recognized it in him. Pilate, who was an outsider, tried to defend this Jewish man. Here's what I mean. After he said this, he, being Pilate, went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. And it says now, Barabbas was a robber. I'm going to clarify that for you. Barabbas wasn't merely a robber. Barabbas incited riots in which Jewish citizens were killed by Roman soldiers. Barabbas was selfish. Barabbas was a seditionist. He wanted to break away from Roman rule by any means necessary, including sacrificing his own countrymen. So when the Pharisees called free Barabbas, they called for somebody who was just like them. When we call out our champions, are we calling out the name of Jesus Christ? Or are we calling out people who are just like us? In closing today, church, I want us to think about some things. When we follow Jesus, we will be put under trial. More importantly, Jesus said these words to his disciples, because the world hated you or hated me, it will hate you also. We need to understand that that is not a maybe, that is a definite. If we are living for Christ, we will face persecution. It's going to happen in one way, shape, or form. Right now, there are Christians being killed by the sword. Right now, there are Christians being imprisoned illegally and tortured for Christ. Right now, there are Christians being crucified on roadsides. Look at what's going on in Africa. Look at what's going on in China. Look at what's going on in the Middle East. And the persecutions we face are nothing compared to that. Y'all might recall that pastor who was imprisoned for several years in Turkey. And when he was released, the very first message he delivered was, America is not ready for this. Church, the Lord is preparing us. I don't know what for. I'm not going to say that we're going to see persecution in our lifetime. We may. And by persecution, what I mean is imprisonment and secret arrests and tortures and things like that. But He is preparing us now for this moment because just as Jesus was on trial, Jesus promised we too, for His name's sake, will be put before the synagogues and the rulers. That we will be put on trial too for His name's sake. So Jesus is still on trial. Church, go back and look at your Facebook feed. Look at your Twitter feed. Look at what you post on Instagram and Snapchat and everything else and ask yourself this question. If Jesus is on trial right now, What am I witnessing about to Him? Church, He promised us that in this world where we, we would have trouble. But He also said, Be of good cheer, for I've overcome the world. In Matthew 28, 16, it said they went up to the place where Jesus told them to go, the risen Lord, mind you, but some of them doubted. And Jesus got rid of all their fears by saying this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, meaning as you go on your way, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all I've commanded you. And in case the doubt's still there, behold, look upon me, for I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So church, this morning I'm going to ask you, since Jesus is on trial, are you going to stand outside the door and say, I'm not with him? Or are you going to stand beside him like Paul and like Peter eventually did and like Stephen and like all others who stood and counted themselves alongside him? Are you going to stand up and say, you can test Jesus any day? Are you going to be like the two men in, in the 15th century England, the lame painter and the blind net mender who as they were getting dragged to the gallows for distributing the word of God 
said, brother, we're about to be healed. Thee of thy blindness and me of my lameness. Are we counted among the faithful? Are we standing not merely in the jury saying he needs to live? Are we standing in the gallows with Christ? This is the message we need to send, church. We need to constantly let people know and assure them that our faith in God is immovable, unshakable, and that no matter what happens to us physically, we are with Him eternally. Jesus said in the book of Revelation, to Him who endures, I will let Him sit with me on my throne. Church, I want to have a nice seat when I get to heaven. Are you going to endure as well? So by way of closing and by way of response, since we're not going to do an altar call today, <laughs> I'd like all of us to sing uh, the four verses, and I'll sing the first line of each one of I've Decided to Follow Jesus. If you are willing to stand up with Jesus, and I want you to sing loudly. Sing that Murfreesboro can hear you, not just simply on Facebook, but hear your voices sing. Let's sing I've Decided to Follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back, though none go with me. Still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. Me. No turning back. No turning back. Let's pray. Our gracious and heavenly Father, thank you for calling us to this point in this time in this year. Let us not be discouraged, but let us be empowered, Lord, by the boldness that the Holy Spirit gives us. And though we are to distance ourselves, God, let us with boldness proclaim your gospel. Give us the tools, Lord. You've given us cell phones. You've given us messengers where we can see each other face to face, even though we're distanced from one another. You've given us all sorts of ways, Lord, that we can build up your body and share the gospel. I pray, Father God, with all my heart and all my mind and all my soul and all my strength, that we would follow you with all these things and that we would love our neighbor as yourself, that we would pick up our cross after denying ourselves and follow after your son. That, Lord, we know we are in this race to win a prize. That, Lord, we know that you have all things in your victorious, righteous right hand that there are no emergencies where you are only plans. That your son did all things on purpose. And so, Father, my prayer is for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit that we too may walk like he did, that we too may do all things on purpose, that we too, Lord, may seek his face in all things. That, Lord, when persecution does come, and it will, we may face it like your son, standing proudly, saying, I am with him. We love you, Lord. We lift all these things up that you will be honored and glorified. Empower us now, your church. Shake buildings, Lord. Shake us to our foundation. You pour out your spirit and do something mighty. We pray these things for your name's sake, for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless y'all, everybody. I'm glad y'all came out. And uh, go out and be the church. <laughs>